This is your reality check. Welcome to Reality Check, the Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. Today is August 3rd, and I'm producer Pat. We have two interesting segments for you today. Adam is going to talk to us about the Rogers outage, Rogers being a very large telecommunication company here in Canada. But first, after a very long hiatus, Christina and I spoke to our friend, Dr. Stuart Robbins. Now, a word about this segment. We talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. However, when we get some of Stuart's time, we generally try and throw many topics at him. So we spoke for a couple of hours. All that to say, he does mention a couple other topics, which will come out in future episodes. And with that, here's our discussion with Dr. Stuart Robbins. Welcome back to the Reality Check, Dr. Stuart Robbins. Thank you for having me back. It's been a while. It's been a minute. And by a minute, I mean like a year and a half, almost two years. That's crazy. Something like that. Well, we've kept in touch, but we've not had you back on the show, so. Yeah, well, we've all been busy and all had our own various issues, one of which I will talk about later in this recording. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Stuart, how have you been? You've been to Australia, you've been all over the place. What are you working on? Yeah, uh, let's see. How, well, since last we talked in early 2020, I think, maybe maybe late 2020? I don't know. It's It's been a while. Uh, I've been working as usual. Uh, I did recently travel to Australia and back. They have lower COVID rates than a lot of the rest of the world. So I, I got out and in fine. No sickness. Uh, you know, if the price of not getting sick anymore is wearing a mask in public, I'm, I'm happy to keep wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Still, still doing science. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, sir, big in astronomy news is the first images from the James Webb Space Telescope. So I hear, and so I see, mm -hmm. all over Facebook. Mm -hmm. So you and I have shared these pictures back and forth, and I, I really wanted to ask you, what is it that we're seeing? I, I assume it's like a deep field image like we remember from, from telescopes past, but what am I seeing? Right. So you're referring to the very first image that was released before the others, uh, a day before the others. So this is a deep field image. Um, I believe the integration time, so how long it actually stared at this spot of space was something like 12 hours or so. Um, you are looking basically at SMACS J0723.3-7327. So, well, I, I mean, that. it's a fun thing to look at. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, for people who, who don't understand that catalog number, that is a galaxy cluster. Uh, so you're seeing in the middle a galaxy cluster, and that galaxy cluster is so heavy and had so much mass to it, as opposed to weight, something else we will address later this episode. Uh, since it has so much mass to it, it acts like a gravitational lens. So you are seeing relativity in action, action, action. So what you're seeing is effectively this gigantic mass of galaxies is bending space around it, and it is acting like a giant lens. So what you see all around that central glowy stuff are other galaxies, but they're stretched out. They look almost as if they're, uh, well stretched out. <laughs> and that's because you're effectively seeing them as though you were looking through a, uh, a spherical glass sphere thing. Uh, as I said, I'm a little out of practice at this explanation stuff, but uh, it, it's like you're looking through a glass sphere. And if you look at an object through a glass sphere, you get all of these distortions and you get stuff uh, behind that sphere being magnified, but also sort of distorted and spread out into these sort of streamers. And that is what you're seeing all around that central galaxy cluster. One of the nice things about this gravitational lensing is it actually lets us see stuff that is farther away than we would otherwise be able to see because it is uh, effectively it's zoomed in something else we might talk about on this episode, uh, but it's effectively being zoomed in on as it's being bent around that galaxy cluster. So this is how we can see even farther than we would otherwise is we can use some of these gravitational lenses to see these more distant objects. Fascinating. So I had read Stuart that the patch of sky that it's actually imaging is if you held a grain of sand at your arm's length on earth, does that make any sense? Yeah. It does. So that's basically mind blowing to me when I read that I was, that's incredible. 
Right. So, so it's all about the field of view. And you know, your eyes have a fairly big field of view. You can see uh, a normal sighted person can see, uh, I'm looking side to side right now, maybe a 120 degree field of view. Whereas a camera lens is going to see, uh, depending on what kind, maybe anywhere from about one degree to about 50 degrees. Uh, if you're looking through a, a straw, be it plastic or pasta or something else material that is more popular these days, you're going to see even a smaller field of view. And if you hold a piece of, of sand, a small grain of sand out in an arm's length, that's an even smaller field of view. And that is effectively the patch of sky that James Webb was staring at in order to get this image. That actually doesn't compute for me. Mm -hmm. I just saw <laughs> so your you're, brain break there. Yeah. <laughs> so you're looking just at, at a very small area of sky. Uh, it depends on what the field of view is of the camera that you're using and the optics that you're using. So your own eyes see a pretty big field of view. But if you were to restrict your eyes by looking through a, a tube of, of whatever, be it toilet paper or a straw or something, then you're going to see a much smaller field of view. And if you tighten that up even more, then you're going to see what this picture is, an even smaller field of view. Now, there's a lot of stuff in that field of view, and I think that that's the point of this image, right. is right. that you can stare almost anywhere in the sky at even the smallest little bit of it. And if you can see really far, you're going to see a lot of stuff. So the idea being if we picked a, a grain of sand and moved, let's say, 20 degrees to the left we might get the same image of different stuff. Well, it wouldn't be the same image. It would be... A similar image. A, a similar image, right. You would still see a bunch of galaxies, a few foreground Milky Way stars, but uh, just a bunch of stuff. And this is what we found out also with the Hubble Deep Field. So the very first Hubble Deep Field was from December of 20... No, December of 1995. And they just stared at an otherwise empty patch of sky... And they saw all this stuff. And Hubble repeated this, uh, I think the latest was maybe 2014 or 2016. And each time they looked in seemingly otherwise empty patches of sky, they saw stuff because Hubble was able to see much fainter than we could otherwise see from other observatories. And now the JWST can see even fainter than Hubble. So the uh, JWST is, what I've read, is it's near-infrared, which I'm not sure 100% what that is, that the instrument is near-infrared that actually, quote-unquote, took the picture. So does that mean that, that it we're taking an image in sort of wavelengths that we can't see? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so then how does this become an image that we're sharing on the Internet? Well, so what it does is it, it captures light in wavelengths that we really can't see very well or at all. So the shortest wavelength that it can capture is about 600 nanometers or 6 micrometers. Um, so 600 nanometers to the human visible perception, uh, again, assuming that you have a, a normal visual perception, is around yellow to orangish in color. But then it can see much, 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 much longer wavelengths of light. Uh, so from 600 nanometers up to 28,000 nanometers. And once you get past about 720 or 750, then you're starting to get into infrared. So because it can go way past 750 nanometers, it sees into the infrared. As for near-infrared versus mid-infrared versus far-infrared, those are sort of more arbitrary cutoffs. Um, I mean, anyone who's interested can do an internet search and uh, see sort of where those are on the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. So they're basically taking these signals and then assigning colors to them as we would see with our eyes. So how much of this is science and how much of this is, without throwing anyone under the bus, artistic embellishment? There's nothing wrong with artistic embellishment, no, there but isn't. Uh, in, in this case, um, they're just taking these images uh, that were done with different wavelengths of light and then assigning them a color that we can see. So they might take something that's a thousand nanometers and assign it to 400 nanometers, which is purplish blue. They might take something that is 5,000 nanometers and assign that to green, about uh, 550. They might take something that's 28,000 nanometers, 
and assign that to about 700 or red. And then you have red, green, and blue. And so you have a three color composite, which will look like a color image that we're seeing. So the art would just come in with, um, if they took more than three filters or more than three images, because actually JWST has a couple different instruments and none of the cameras that are taking pictures like this actually use filters. I think they're all different detectors, actually. So what they would do is they would take these images from different detectors and they would just assign them different colors that then we can see and composite them in a way that looks like this. Now, usually when we do that, we do shorter wavelengths. So more blue wavelengths are going to be assigned blue and longer wavelengths. So more red wavelengths are going to be assigned red. Uh, that's just sort of typically that's what's done, but you don't have to do that. So I think in a previous episode, we talked about the Sombrero Galaxy. Yeah. And you asked why it looks so different in all these different images. And I said, well, depends on what color the images were taken in and how they combined it. And it's the same thing here. So you could take the data, if it was three or more filters, I'm sorry, not filters, three or more detectors, you could take that same data and assign them different colors and get something that looked different in terms of what your color uh, is going to look like. So, Stuart, this is all very exciting, and the images are cool, but do you know what's happening next with James Webb? It's still taking images. In fact, I, I'm pretty sure that it's already taken a lot more data. Uh, we just haven't seen it yet, because right. what happens is that uh, astronomers propose to use it to do their science, uh, It's and then it goes through a peer review process, and a technical feasibility process, like can the detector actually do this? And do you have to have James Webb to do this? Or can you do it through something else? Um, if it then passes through all of that, then they get the telescope time and it's commanded to observe that object and the data comes down. And then usually the scientists have uh, a period of three months or six months or 12 months that the data are all of theirs. And after that, it has to be released publicly. I don't know what the time period is for JWST, and it can change throughout the course of the mission. So I'm sure that they've already uh, taken more data, and it's being analyzed by scientists now. Well, here's a couple of fun facts um, that I saw on CBC. Canada has guaranteed 5% of the telescope's working time. And there's two scientists at the University of Alberta that are doing some research and they're just chomping at the bit to use it. But what I thought was actually quite interesting that I hadn't read before recently is that Canada provided a fine guidance sensor, which keeps the telescope locked on a celestial target. It also contributed the spectrograph that can be used to determine the composition of objects it took images of, including the makeup of atmospheres of exoplanets. That's fascinating because I know that I read they were saying this is the composition of this planet or this is the composition of that planet. How does that work, Stuart? Yeah, so that was one of the first uh, sets of data that were released the day after that deep field image. Right. Uh, so this was the spectrometer. So what it does is it takes the light that's gathered up and then it, it basically puts it through a prism and it separates that light out into its different wavelengths. And you can see how much light is at each wavelength. And that's something that we call a spectrum. And you can use that in order to figure out what the object you're looking at is made of. So we know what the spectrum, for example, of hydrogen is because we can look at it in the lab, split it up with the same kind of prism and look at what wavelengths of light hydrogen emits. We can do the same thing with helium. We can do the same thing with oxygen and so on and so forth and all sorts of materials. And this is how uh, these sort of spectrometers work is then you, you get the data and then you sort of look for are there telltale signs of where water is a really strong absorber. And so can we look to see if that uh, line is in that spectrum or not? So, okay, maybe there is or isn't water. And then this all has to do with also uh, how well you can detect it. So, for example, it wouldn't do very uh, well to look for a type of molecule that is not or does not have a signature in the infrared because JWST does not see other wavelengths of light. So if you're looking for a molecule that is strongest in ultraviolet, you would not use JWST. Uh, water, however, is very strong in the infrared, which is one of the issues with climate change on our own planet.
What's up, Cuboids? If you live in Canada, you've likely heard of or been directly impacted by the widespread Rogers outage of July 8th, 2022. If you don't, then let me give you an idea. Rogers, a massive telecommunications company in Canada, had an almost complete outage of its data network affecting internet, cellular data, and more on July 8th, from early in the morning until uh, around midnight at the end of the day. Now, this was a Friday, and the outage impacted businesses, leisure, payment, and law enforcement. Well, what exactly was the impact? Because there were a lot of claims, and I'd like to discuss what really happened. Now, this is bound to be a pretty Canadian type of segment, but hopefully listeners from other places can reflect upon how a similar event might impact them in their own country and what they might be able to do to mitigate against such a problem. Now, there were a lot of statements made on that day and the days that followed, but one that stuck out was a particularly viral message I saw reshared far and wide. So this is just an example. There are a lot of similar things, but I just want to dissect this particular one as a kind of starting point. So it was a tweet, which I likely originally saw as a screenshot on Facebook, because most of my friends on Facebook are Canadian, and most of the people I follow on Twitter are not Canadian. So let me quote this, originally posted by user AVI Justin, and I quote, The fact that when Rogers goes out, it knocks out ATMs, non-cash payment abilities, 911 services, internet and mobile for almost all of Canada should be the warning sign that monopolies put Canadian citizens at unnecessary risk. So first off, I agree with the spirit of the message. (laughs) So the, the, the sort of monopoly over telecommunications in Canada, specifically in Ontario and some other provinces is is pretty bad. So there's Rogers and Bell, they're the main ones, and then there's some smaller companies. And there's a lack of competition, which means very high costs. And I understand that this is partly a reflection of the sheer size of the country, since it's, it's, not, it's not like you might have in the US. But the prices here are really not competitive compared to the United States, Europe, or a lot of other places in the world. Now, I live in Quebec. There's a bit more competition because there are a bit more companies in the game. And compared to Ontario, where I used to live, and that's reflected in better prices. So some people will get an 819, that's, that's on, on this side of the river, phone number, and they'll get a better price for their cell phone than with a 613, that's the Ottawa side phone number, or whatever the other one is, 343. So back to the message in question. So first it says, it knocked out ATMs, non-cash payments, 911 services, most internet and mobile in Canada. Is any of this true? So let's start with the 911 claims. Since I saw this repeated over and over throughout the day on the outage. Were 911 services down? Not really. So the network that the 911 services run on seemed fine. Um, there's, there's a bunch of different 911 services, but that, that they seemed okay. Calls from phones that worked still got through to 911. The issue was that a lot of people who had cell phones or voice over IP phones on Rogers didn't have any service. So they they couldn't call 911. So for example, the Toronto police uh, had this message. Our 911 call center is fully operational. Some Rogers network callers may have difficulty connecting. If the call connects, please stay on the call as long as possible. If you can't connect, please call back. But they couldn't call 911 because they couldn't call anybody. This is bad. But is it specifically bad for 911, right? So in general, it's preferable to keep 911 services working even when nothing else is working. But in this case, well, no- nothing was working. <laughs> they, they couldn't get through. It's worth also explaining a bit of how voice over IP works. So generally, this is a type of phone line that works over data on a network. So in this case, if someone has a phone line which relies on an active internet connection and that internet connection goes down, the phone does not work. So if you have a a Rogers voice over IP phone and the Rogers internet network is gone, your phone's not working. Some people still have landlines. These are less and less common these days, but those were likely unaffected. Obviously, the outage to Rogers cell phones was the greater issue here because a lot of people have cell phones rather than landlines or Rogers voice over IP phones. So my understanding is that voice and text was restored for phones fairly early in the day uh, while data services were unavailable for the remainder of the day. So this likely meant that 911 services were restored earlier in the day for many users, uh, as opposed to, you know, the, the data that was not available pretty much till till the end of the day, till midnight. So 911 services weren't really knocked out. They were just not available to people who couldn't use their phones. All right. What else was said? So they said it knocked out ATM and non-cash payment abilities. So there's a lot going on here. To be specific, the problem that usually this was talking about is 
Interac being down. So Interac is a Canadian interbank network, which is used for financial transactions. And the main thing this is used for is debit cards. Um, so you basically, you use your checking account to pay for things at uh, out of cash. So I believe this type of payment is, is less common maybe in the US than it is in Canada. A lot of people use this pretty much exclusively to buy things. Uh, and some businesses will actually say Interac or cash only, no credit card because there's more fees for credit cards. So this also affected something called e-transfers. It's a way Canadians use to send money to other Canadians uh, through their bank. So I'm not sure about the technical specifics, but it seems like the Interact network either runs exclusively on a Rogers network or has some sort of single point of failure that runs on that network that meant it was not working at all. So it was it was out. That's a big one. Um, it does not constitute all non-cash payment abilities, but it does constitute a, a good chunk of them. Other things were surely affected. So ATMs, that being bank machines, were affected, but n- not necessarily all of them. So I think some of them do use Interact as a way to get money. Not all of them do, but if, if the ATM is basically connected to the internet through a Rogers internet connection, that wasn't working. Credit cards were also not all down, so some businesses whose internet connection runs on a Rogers network might not have had the ability to process credit cards, but the credit cards themselves should have worked. Um, you, you should have been able to pay with those. So in this case, it's inaccurate to say that ATMs and non-cash payment abilities were knocked out. The lot of options were, and they were severely restricted on Friday the entire day. So the last part of the statement is it knocked out internet and mobile services for most of Canada. Okay, most? Well, it's hard to get specific numbers, but I saw it mentioned that 25% of Canada's internet traffic was affected. That's a lot. It's not most. Most is more than half, more than 50%. I also found some numbers from 2015 that said that Rogers has a 33% market share for wireless, that being cell phones. So that's more than any other company, the main competition being Bell with 28% and TELUS with 29%. So most would be more than half. Again, it's not most, it's it's more than the competition. In 2021, according to Rogers' 2021 annual report, it said that they had 11.3 million wireless subscribers and 2.7 million internet subscribers, so internet uh, at home. The population of Canada is 38 million, so less than a third of Canadians have Rogers cell phones, but not every Canadian has a cell phone. I live with two that don't. As for internet access, I was a bit surprised that their market share for internet access seemed lower um, at only 2.7 million, but one should consider that a household may have many cell phones and only one internet uh, connection. So much to say if 2.7 million households in a country of 38 million have Rogers internet, that's probably not most. In 2016, the number of households in Canada was 14 million, and roughly 94% of households have a broadband internet connection. So it seems that Rogers has about a quarter of that internet market share, so that 25% of internet being down uh, seems to accurately reflect that as well. So this, so this particular tweet is demonstrably wrong in, in most measurable ways, but that's not to say that the disruption wasn't significant um, or that, that, that you know it, it wasn't a big problem for a lot of people. I was not personally affected. I used to have internet access that ran on the Rogers network probably around 98 to 2013, but I've been off their network since I moved to Quebec. Um, still, I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are on Rogers for internet and phone. Uh, my workplace is still doing remote work, so a lot of people weren't able to get online, needed to go into the office, and I think a lot of people were in very similar settings. The Canadian website Mobile Syrup, which mainly covers sort of Canadian cell phone news, it gave a detailed overview of what was affected. I think it's important to tease out what the impacts really were for these things instead of just kind of going through the list and saying, oh, that's Rogers, that it's their fault that this was this was down. Beyond Rogers itself, there are a lot of cell phone carriers and internet service providers which basically use Rogers' network. So those were affected too. So this includes cell phones for Chatter and Fido. And for internet access, this includes internet service providers like Tech Savvy. So I was on Tech Savvy internet for years. And basically, my, my Tech Savvy was on Rogers Infrastructure. You can also get it on Bell Infrastructure, which is just another company. So you know, I had a tech savvy modem, but it plugged into a cable which was connected to the Rogers network. I could plug a Rogers TV cable box into that same coax and it got a signal. It, it, it was found on that network. So it's basically the exact same network. So while having this kind of reseller adds some amount of competition in the market, it ultimately doesn't help in this kind of situation with an, with an outage that affects the network itself. There are, of course, potentially other sorts of problems that might only affect Rogers clients or only affect tech savvy clients, 
depending on the specific technical nature of that problem. There were a lot of businesses and government organizations who reported their services being limited or unavailable, and this generally boiled down to their services running on a Rogers network somehow or relying on a Rogers service. So Canadian Blood Services, for example, they do blood donations in Canada. They had an outage to their website and application, and they were asking people to book appointments. Service Canada, which is a sort of centralized department for handling client-based services for the government of Canada, said that there were outages that were affecting some of their call centers. So I don't, I don't know anything about the internal structure of Services Canada. I don't work there. Um, but this could be due to something like the call centers having a Rogers-based internet connection. could be that some of their employees who are working remotely just didn't have internet access. Or it could be that they are basically having employees who are working on cell phones that are on the Rogers network. And that could be how some of their call center employees work. So CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency, is responsible for tax collecting in Canada, they similarly had no telephone services, so you wouldn't be able to call and get help there. But luckily, it's not tax season, so it was probably not too bad. Uh, another so-called outage mentioned was with the Arrive Can app. So this is a health declaration form that people use when they come into Canada. But this wasn't really a real outage. So Canada Border Services Agency, CBSA, they simply said that due to the Rogers outage, some users wouldn't have access to the app and should use paper, but this is just because those people didn't have any service on their phone. I think it's a little silly to highlight this kind of thing. Amazon didn't come out and say, by the way, even though all our servers are running fine in the, in the States and everything's good, you can't buy things on Amazon because your Rogers internet connection is working today. Another issue, which on the day that I'm recording this, June 11th, isn't totally clear, is what exactly happened. <laughs> So Rogers described this as, and I quote, network system failure following a maintenance update in our core network, which caused some of our routers to malfunction early Friday morning. Now, I've heard it suggested that this was a BGP problem, that being border gateway protocol, a type of network protocol, but Rogers has not at this time confirmed this, so I can't really say that's it. I'm not a, I'm not a network guy. That's not really what I do at work. Um, I won't a attempt to improperly explain, you know, what, how BGP works because that might not actually be what's going on. Um, so much to say Rogers did a core network update. This caused the outage. It wasn't ransomware. It wasn't hackers or anything of the sort. I do find it a bit disappointing that there was almost no communication about the source of the problem most of the day. They were just saying like, the source is unknown. We're still looking into it. And that's that kind of standard stuff. Now, surely they probably didn't know exactly what was wrong because when you know exactly what the technical problem is, you can resolve it. So if the problem is not resolved, it usually means you don't actually know exactly what it is, but they should have reasonably been able to infer that the early morning update that they did to their core network right before the early morning outage started, there was probably some relation there. Um, this was not well communicated by the guy in a t-shirt I saw doing a remote video call who seemed very distracted. Um, so that was not a great situation for Rogers. They're not getting some great press for the whole thing. I wonder though, what ISP this guy used to call in and talk to the press. <laughs> so much to say, it wasn't a hardware issue. I'm sure all those systems are redundant, um, but it was a type of network system software failure. We could get into high availability, disaster recovery and other things like that, but you know, there, there'd probably be a whole other whole other show on that. I'm sure Rogers is, at this point, prepared to avoid having this specific problem occur again, but the next thing won't be the same as the last thing, so I'm sure it, it could be something else next time. Now, here around Ottawa, there was a major storm a while back, which caused widespread power outages. This, in turn, left people without home internet and, in some cases, no phone service. But I never saw this described as a 911 outage, or I never heard this described as a, uh, an impact to a service which someone needed power to operate. The store had no power, so they couldn't process credit cards, but people weren't saying that Visa was out. So monopolies or, or, or situations where a small number of companies have control uh, is, are not great. Competition is generally good. Bundling your services may be dangerous. And if you're a business or government agency, you might want to think about what you depend on. That said, not everything that's being blamed on this outage is really the fault of the outage itself. You can't call anyone without a phone. You can't access an app or website without a phone. That's pretty standard stuff. I'm not going to blame my friend if I can't call him because my phone doesn't work. That's silly. Peace out, cuboids. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. 
Follow us on Twitter at TRC underscore podcast. Thank you.